Hi there. Uh, how's it going? Uh, so I'm here to talk about the internet of browsers. Um, and before we get started, we've got a bit of interactive stuff that's going to happen. Uh, so I want you to get out your phones or laptops and visit this URL, uh, which is bit.ly slash fsfbcn. Um, so, and a bit of a warning, there's like, so this obviously relies on like conference Wi-Fi, which is a really bad thing to rely on. Um, but so if you could maybe try and not download videos or uh, upload stuff too much, that would be really cool, because uh, it's better if it works. Um, so what you should see when you visit that URL is uh, a big green circle. Um, and above that, you should see a, a four-digit hex decimal code. And the most important thing is I want you to remember that four-digit hex decimal code. It's going to disappear in a few minutes. Um, so if you could um, yeah, write it down, tell your neighbor, uh, tweet it to yourself, or whatever you want. Um, so that's, yeah, remember that number. And everyone's got a different number. Um, right, so is that working? Perfect. Uh, so yeah, I'm Ben. Uh, I've come over from the UK where I work in a company called White October in Oxford. Uh, so we build uh, stuff for the web, and I head up the front-end engineering team there, uh, which is a lot of fun. Another thing I do in Oxford is I help run JS Oxford. Uh, so we're a kind of relatively small meetup group, and we have um, yeah, meetings every couple of months and stuff. Uh, the, actually, by chance, like the entire organization crew, which is three of us, uh, are in here today. Uh, so yeah, hi, guys. <laughs> um, one of the other things that we've done through the summer is this project called Summer of Hacks, which is basically very uh, practical hack days where we can kind of get together and just build stuff, uh, which has been a lot of fun. And we're trying to think of expanding this next year. So if anyone wants to get involved with that, give one of us a shout. So that's, uh, that's me. And I'm here to give this talk about internet of browsers. Uh, so this talk is uh, a play on uh, the term internet of things, uh, which I would define as lots of devices that are connected together that are able to take input from their environment and also, made, also able to make changes to their environment and that are connected together uh, by the internet. And I really love the internet of things. Uh, I think I love it for a couple of reasons. Uh, firstly, we're seeing all these like, really interesting new types of devices that are coming out, um, like network connected bike locks, or fire alarms, and just really interesting ways of interacting with technology. Um, and the second reason I like it is that I think it's really changed the way that, as a developer, how we view problems um, and solutions. And rather than having to be locked into a particular way of developing software, we're kind of inventing new ways to kind of interact with technology. And I think the key part of this is this word thing. Uh, so I'm going to read out this definition. Uh, thing, an object that one need not, cannot, or does not wish to give a specific name to. Look at that metal rail thing over there. And I like, this, I like the vagueness of this, uh, this definition. It's really kind of just whatever. Uh, you don't actually have to kind of care about what it is. Um, and I think by thinking about things, it kind of liberates us to just not really bother too much about the implementation details. So I'm here to talk about browsers. And browsers, um, browsers are quite different from a thing. Okay? Like we know what to feed in and what we expect to get out the other side. We kind of know how it works. And also, the websites that we build are very much informed by the websites that we built in the past or the websites that we've browsed. And so we're, um, without realizing, we're quite tied into a particular idea of how the web should be. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have this vague notion of opportunities to have. Right. <laughs> um, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at 
our devices in this room as things. And I need to refresh this because it's broken a little bit. Right, here we are. Cool. Um, so every circle on this graph represents one of our devices that's connected uh, to that URL that you first visited. And so your screens, that number should have disappeared, and it will have turned gray. If it's not, you might want to refresh, because <laughs> uh, you can do that, because it's the web. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at each of these browsers and their capabilities and the kind of things that we can read from them. So first up, we've got meta information, information about the device itself. Um, what data we can read about that. So first up, we've got battery. So you can access uh, the battery API. And this allows you to kind of see the current level of the battery. So you can see some here aren't as charged as the others. And the pink ones are the ones that are currently charging as well. So you can detect that through the battery API and see, detect when that changes. And the gray ones here don't, uh, don't have access to the battery API, so we can't pull out that data. Every one of our devices supports geolocation through the web API. So you can kind of pull out your latitude, longitude, the precision of that. You can also um, do it in a way that you get updates periodically as you're moving around. So we can find out where our device is within the world, which is huge, right? Our devices have a location, but they also have a position. And we can read the orientation of our devices, uh, like which way it's actually facing um, in its environment. Um, and we can kind of gather that together. It doesn't always work for laptops. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. Um, yes, yeah, so we can find out what orientation the device has uh, to like the center of the world, which is kind of handy. Proximity, so a few devices support proximity API, and this allows you to see how far away an object is from that device. So the, the standard use case is when you're holding your phone to your, uh, to your face to answer a call, you can detect that through the proximity API. Um, but as far as things go, it's quite cool to be able to see that another thing is close by your thing in your hand, uh, which is kind of handy. So that's data about the particular device itself. But we can also pull in data from our environments and uh, read stuff. So video and audio. So using uh, Get User Media, we can access uh, webcam and microphone streams. So we can pull out all this data from our environment um, and yeah, do whatever we want with that. We've got fairly good support here. Um, the ambient light API allows you to see the, the lighting in the room uh, in lumens. So you, rather than having to access it through a webcam and try and work out from that, you can actually access the raw lumen value uh, from the light in the room. So you can adapt your interface appropriately. And touch, like so our devices can see if we're touching them with, uh, with our fingers. So we can kind of see, um, we can do a lot with that, right? Like that's a really kind of powerful thing to be able to do. And this obviously drives the way that we interact with the web. Right. So that's the way that we can gather, the ways that we can gather input into our devices uh, using the web platform. We can also make changes to our environment uh, with a number of different APIs. So uh, some of our devices support uh, the Vibrate API. So we can actually physically move our devices. Uh, so if it supports, your phone will buzz every couple of seconds. Um, and that's really powerful that like, through calling a JavaScript method, we can make something move uh, with that. We have access to the pixels on each phone. So we can change the color of objects in a room, which is super powerful when you think about it, um, like changing the color of things. <laughs> um, and obviously, you can do this to a lot finer grain control. Another thing we have is audio. Um, so using the web audio API, we can synthesize sounds. 
Um, so if you, yeah, turn up your volumes, you can hear all these different tones um, are being generated on your device itself, and so it's kind of random tones between two different frequencies. Um, so we're able to kind of make sound waves from our devices, and we'll actually kind of go into this in a little bit more detail in a bit. That's going to happen a lot. Um, cool. Cheers. Um, so the other thing uh, this, uh, we have with our devices is that they're connected to other things. Um, so we can connect our devices through web APIs to anything that is exposing that. So for instance, um, sky is clear, 25.68 degrees centigrade. This is the weather in Tokyo. So we're able to access this uh, through just a fetch command and we can talk to another device that knows what weather it is in Tokyo. And we can do this with the same ease that we might access a local property of the orientation of our devices, um, which is really powerful. Oops. OK, so why should we bother thinking about things on this level, like input, output, and general devices? I think it's quite easy as a developer to get caught up in the implementation, uh, so to think that writing code is my job, when actually my job is about facilitating a user to achieve a task. And I think it's quite easy to kind of get caught up in choosing the right framework or writing things with the right indentation. Um, and I think it's, it's hard sometimes to kind of keep focus on that, um, that end goal of our craft. So at Wildtober, we, do, uh, we have multidisciplinary teams. And this kind of helps us get around this by working really closely with UX design and development together. And so by kind of keeping, like by using user stories and wireframes, it allows us to kind of align what we're trying to achieve, uh, which is something for the user to, to interact with. And I think we can take this even further by just Imagining a user trying to do a thing and seeing how the object they have in their hand fits into that. So maybe it's not about them um, pressing a call to action, or maybe it's not about them filling out a form. Maybe they um, they want. Maybe it's easier for them to like make a phone call or uh, move this, wave this phone around. But I think it's really it can be powerful to to think of what we create on this kind of term. Um, to, and how our solutions can fit around that. And what I think it should, some, what I would like to think it boils down to is that people use things to do stuff. And working with this kind of like vagueness, uh, I think that allows us to um, create the best solution for solving someone's problem. Cool. Um, so what we've done is we've looked at our devices as not just being browsers, but being things, and the things that we can kind of pull out from that. But there's something quite interesting about all of our devices that visited that URL, and that's that we all, they all share the same environment, this space. So what we're going to do is we're going to play around with that a little bit. And the way we're going to do that is um, I want you to get your phones or laptops and you should see these three buttons, A, B, and C. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a really very rudimentary positioning system, uh, which will work, <laughs> um, by pressing these three buttons at very precise moments. Cool. Um, if you've pressed any of them by accident, press the X to reset it, and then we'll get started. OK. So the A button, uh, what you're going to do is I'm going to, in a few seconds, move my arm slowly across the room. And when it passes you, I want you to press the A button uh, So at that instant. And that's going to give us, obviously, the angle through the room. So is everyone ready? Does that make sense? Cool. 
right, uh, here it comes. Cool. Right. Okay, and we're going to use the B button to work out our distance up through the room. And the way they're going to do this is like with this line along the top. So there's going to be a, a circle that travels along that line. And when it passes where you are, uh, I want you to press the B button. So there's going to be some points. So this point here is the front row down here. Um, this point here is the back of the downstairs area. This point here is the start of the upstairs area. And this point here is right up at the back. Um, so this pink circle is going to travel along really slowly along. And I want you to press the B button when it passes you. Is that clear? Cool. It's going to be about seven seconds. It's all very precise. Cool, ready? Up at the back now. Cool. Right, so we've got those two kind of data points, and we need to have a third point that allows us to work out where they are, how they relate to each other. So, what we're going to do is we're going to press the C button at exactly the same time. So, everyone's going to press it. And once you've done that, our devices should know where they are roughly in the room. So, I'm going to count us down. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count down uh, three, two, one, and then say go. And I want you to press it on the go, not the one. Uh, that's right. OK, so get ready. Go. Five, four, three, two, one, go. Right, now I want you to turn your phones to again, the center of the room on your laptops. So everyone can see the screens. Um, so whatever you've kind of got on the URL and hold it up high. And it should have gone white. Yeah, perfect. And yeah, point it towards the center so that everyone can see. And we should see first, using the uh, angle through the room, it will kind of use a hue. So you can see it goes from blue over here to through to green over that side. And now we're using the Y axis. So it will kind of should go into strips, which are kind of seeing the green strip over there. It kind of works. This is good enough. Yeah, that one's a bit sketchy. And now uh, they're all going white, and we're going to play a note as it travels around the room. So it's going to go this way around. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's worked all right. So um, that what happened. So all of our devices kind of calculated themselves where they are in the room. But because we're all connected together, uh, we should be able to visualize, we should be able to gather that information um, in the same way as we'd gather any other information. So this is everyone's devices in the room um, and me in the center. Uh, so you can see there's some people behind me. Uh, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Uh, but you can see like the kind of front row here. Um, yeah. So these are our, our positions in the room. And now that we're all connected together, we can do some interesting stuff with this. Right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get a sound that goes from one side of the room to the other. Um, and our phones are going to change color that yeah, happens a lot. <laughs> um, our phones are going to change color based on their position through that. So we're going to start over on this side. And then we're going to go right up to the back. Then we go behind me. And then over here. And back over to this side. And back over here. Cool. So in about like 10 or 15 seconds, if you hold up your phones again, uh, then we should be able to see the transition of hue going across the room as well. It's going to start low 
It's going to go high. Hopefully. So you should be able to hear it moving through the room. Yep, and I'm not sure where it is actually. So it feels like it's over here. So that's it gone over to this side. I think that's gone up to the back. <laughs> cool. So that's um, us synchronized. Um, so we're using the, the, the timestamp of when you pr last press that C button uh, to kind of synchronize our devices together uh, for the time of that. But this can be when you've got several devices together, um, synchronizing the timestamps can be quite uh, a, a difficult thing to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send out a message where is it? Uh, to play a single note at the same time, and we'll see how this works. So you can hear that kind of, it's not all happening at exactly the same time. And what we're hearing is the latency of our particular devices to their, their network. Uh, so I'll try that again. So it's not just one single note. And then this gets a bit harder when we're playing several notes together. Yeah, so that's not very musical. Uh, <laughs> it, what's really interesting about this is you can actually hear the latency happening. Like that last note was more delayed than any of the others, I guess because the Wi-Fi hotspots got saturated or something. Um, so a way around this is instead of um, relying on a single point in time, instead of expecting something to happen there, we can kind of embrace this sketchiness. Um, and instead of playing a single note at a single time, we can distribute our note playing over a, a longer period of time and make it fade in and fade out. So what we're going to play is we're going to play that same note, but it's going to increase over time and get a bit louder and a bit more notey, and then it's going to fade out again. Okay, or not. There's a lot of things going on here. <laughs> One second. Uh, I'm going to turn the Wi Fi off. Cool. Right, okay, so we're going to play this note and it's going to come in, hopefully, yeah. So it's going to come in slowly and quietly, but then get a bit more intense. And then fade out a little bit. So instead of playing a note at a particular time, we're kind of embracing this, the way the network's uh, not allowing us to do that, that limitation. So what we can use this to do is we can combine these two things together. So we can use this, this idea of not relying on a particular timestamp, but um, fading it in, in a kind of uh, distribution, and our position in the room. So what we're going to do is we're going to get these two, like, we're going to get some rooks, and we're going to get them to play right up at the back of the room and move down towards the front. So it's going to sound like a flock of rooks, hopefully. Um, it might be quite scary. Uh, I'm sorry for that. OK. 
you feel it kind of moving down, right? <laughs> yeah, so that's like, um, yeah, so basically we're kind of rolling that wave of frequency down through the room and the volume is going up at the same time, so we get a bit more of a notion of movement in the space. <laughs> that's basically going to happen for the rest of this talk. Uh, so, yeah, I don't really know much about birds, um, but in kind of like looking for bird sounds, uh, I found this, the sound of a rook. So we played like a one like call of a rook. But when a rook plays, uh, when, it, when it makes its call, it does several of these same calls. And then the last one sounds really interesting. It sounds like the rook's been surprised. Um, so as a bit of a side note, we're going to listen to some rooks. Uh, so watch out for the last one when it sounds surprised. Love rooks. Um, kingfishers. Uh, so these are like little tiny birds that are native to the UK. They don't usually um, swarm around the place. Uh, but if they did, they might sound something like this. So we're going to get some kingfishers. So this is a higher pitched noise, which is better for the, so it's going to move from the front to the back. And you can hear it getting a bit more intense as that kind of wave's coming in. They're a bit cuter than rooks, but uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the interesting thing about this is that um, we're utilizing the environment of our devices together. Uh, so we're not playing media on a particular device. Um, we're playing it in the space between devices, uh, which I find really interesting. And it's only by thinking about how the sites that we create, how they are used, uh, that you can start utilizing that kind of thing. So we've talked about um, our devices as things, and we've talked about our things as sharing an environment in which with us. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is how we actually, how technology is related to us, our kind of relationship with this uh, virtual world. Because I think, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I don't know if know where that came from. Uh, that's really interesting. Uh, so, yeah. So, what I'm going to um, talk about is this, which is so. This is my favorite bit of archaic technology. This is a storage unit from uh, Univac Two um, computer, and. The way this works, uh, what this is called is a mercury delay line storage. And it's a really interesting bit of technology. And the way this works is like you've basically got a line in on one side, uh, which turns into a speaker. And then you've got a line of mercury in that square. And then you've got a microphone on the other side of that with a line out. And what you can do is you can feed input down that first line it gets converted into sound waves and travels down that line of mercury and then gets picked up at the other end by that microphone and converted back into uh, a signal. Um, and critically, this takes a little bit of time to, to, to travel down, so that's the delay through this mercury. And what's interesting, you can, you can feed in uh, data through this. You can encode uh, binary signals and uh, you can feed it in one side, and it will travel along that mercury, and it will get converted back into a signal on the other side after a delay. And when this gets interesting is when you add a feedback line. So as it comes out the other side, it's feeding back into the first input. And so by this method, what we've got is um, we've got persistent storage. But what's really beautiful about this is the actual data is stored in ripples of mercury, right? 
so it's like it's a very physical, um, a physical thing, uh, rather than being a virtual thing. And I think this is like, it can be quite tempting for us to kind of treat our devices as being some kind of virtual magic object when actually they are fundamentally of our physical world. Um, like, I think if we remember that, we can uh, interact more with it. So inversely, um, we are part of that physical world too, so we are kind of connected to technology in a much more profound way than, um, than we sometimes actually cater for. So the way that we interact with websites isn't necessarily, doesn't have to be constrained to a keyboard and mouse. It, it can be touch or it can be much deeper ways, um, a, a way of understanding the technology and feeding into it. <laughs> so uh, rather than um, that Mercury delay line storage, I'm going to show you something else, uh, which is a lot crapper. Um, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to store some data, and that data is going to be in the format of uh, a four-digit hex code. And we're going to map this to a particular point. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to subdivide an area into 16. And then we're going to just pick the first digit and pick the, the relevant um, square of that subdivision. And we're going to subdivide that and then pick the next digit out of that. And then do this again and do this again. And what we've done is we've taken that four-digit hex code, we've mapped it to a particular point. So what I'd like you to do is scroll down on your page, and you should see a text input field. And I want you to put in that four-digit number that I first asked you to remember. remember. Cool. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing all that data that everyone here has memorized. And there's a few wrong ones, but kind of not too bad. Um, and you can see that it's kind of aligned in this circle, uh, which we've kind of re-encoded as these four-digit hex codes. And what I really like about this is when you consider where this data for this image is stored, right? It's kind of stored in everyone's memory. We've kind of like distributed that storage. Um, and it's actually pretty good. <laughs> this is like probably the best I've seen. Um, yeah. So I've kind of talked in a, a pretty literal sense about our relationship with technology and how we can use our browsers and devices to make changes to our environment and to read information from our environment too. Um, but by creating things for the web, we actually have the opportunity to do this in much more deeper and more profound way. Um, so this is a blog that my now colleague, Jared, put together. And this documents his bike rides around the Oxfordshire area. And this particular page is a route from Oxford to London. And I found this and ended up cycling that route from Oxford to London. So this web content changed my life in a physical way in that I got on my bike and cycled 80 miles. And that's a huge thing to have happened for, from uh, Jared just putting that blog up there. This is our JS Oxford community thing, which helps us bring together a community and helps people learn stuff um, and is a lot of fun. And having this website allows us to physically get together and meet. This is a project that one of my friends works on, which is to find out the water levels in the Oxfordshire area by these sensors that he's been putting under bridges. And this website allows you to kind of see if something's flooded. It's, very, it's a very kind of real thing that you're able to kind of get out of that. And in this site, um, I like to think that this site is part of why we're all here today together, sharing this, these talks and learning all this stuff together. Um, and to change the world, I, I think there's only a couple of things you need to do. 
Firstly, to consider what a person is trying to do when you're actually building, um, building a site. And secondly, it has to exist. Okay, so it doesn't really matter if you've got a kind of uh, a perfectly architected um, tool and it never sees the light of day. Uh, you, you want to get something out there to be able to make a difference to people, no matter how hacky, no matter how ugly, um, just make it exist. So yeah, thanks, uh, cheers.